Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Good afternoon. My name is Bobby Stempley. I'm the director of the CERT division at Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. My guest today is Dr. My Michael McQuaid, the vice president for research at Carnegie Mellon University and a founding member of the Defense Innovation Board. The Defense Innovation Board is a federal committee that advises the Secretary of Defense on how best to advance technological innovation. Welcome, Dr. McQuaid. It's very nice to be here. Michael, please. Great. I uh, I found it to be really interesting, um, this uh, this moment in time, and I thought it was a great opportunity for us to talk about security and resilience. For the past 30 years, we've really been focused on increasing security and resilience, and we keep not quite getting there. Right. Um, and uh, most recently, I've been giving a lot of thought about the past and how that can be prologue for the future. And right. so I'm really thrilled that you've been willing to come and talk to us today great. because I want to explore how those innovations that we're dealing with today at CMU and in the future can be so pivotal to help us with this secure future that we need. Before we get started, though, I'd really like to give you the chance to tell us a bit about your role here at Carnegie Mellon. Great. So thank you. And I'm very happy to be here and have a chance to talk to people about cybersecurity, but also about how technology and innovation is changing the mission and the applications and, frankly, the implications of cybersecurity. So, um, but my role at CMU. So. I tell, tell people I have sort of three roles, and depending on how you want to put the PowerPoint bullets together, <laughs> maybe it's 3.5 roles. So so first of all... Half a role. The, the, half a role, yeah. <laughs> first of all, the, the sort of the easy part is that with any research enterprise, the trains have to run. So I have responsibility for the people who enable the research. So the contract officers, the people who do regulatory compliance, the people who do um, technology transfer and monetization, all of the things that enable the brilliant people at CMU to do what they do for themselves, for the country, and for sponsors. So that's one part of the job. Um, the second part, which is the, depending on how many plays you want to count it, is the, the yin and the yang of connections. So part of the way I describe it is my job is to make sure that people who would benefit by knowing the brilliant people at CMU know the brilliant people at CMU. And when I say CMU, I mean CMU, and I mean SEI, and I mean the whole mm -hmm. ecosystem. So we have people that are doing cutting-edge research. They are doing it because they are the best researchers in the world. There are people who should know about that. And, and the obvious case in point of CMU and artificial intelligence if you look at the work that was done by the university over the last four or five years to be sure people in Washington knew more about CMU, policymakers knew more about CMU, that's part of what I'm doing for the university, is to make sure people who know about us uh, should know about us. The flip side of that is to make sure that the people at CMU know what challenges people out there have. So, and ultimately, it's a matchmaking job. So. Um, to be able to be sure that a uh, brilliant researcher in neurosciences is aware of the latest research being done in NIH, or that an application for AI that the Army thinks it needs for, uh, for uh, either a disaster recovery mission or for some other reason knows about the people at CMU. So those mm -hmm. are the two connection parts. And then the third part of the job is advocacy. Um, advocacy for the value of scientific research, the value of what universities and FFRDCs do, and being involved in policy, policy around how you balance open, free, fundamental research with national security interests, and making sure that, that people who ultimately will make decisions that affect how we do and can do our job are aware of all sides of the issues. And so I spend a lot of time in Washington in that regard. Um, and I spent a lot of time advocating for the the missions that a research university is needs to deliver. Um, the last thing I would say is is um, maybe the soapbox I get on all the time. I, I am a profound supporter of what I think has been the most important collaboration in science, technology, innovation the world has ever seen 
perhaps starting with World War II, maybe even a little before that. What the United States created in the last half of the last century and is in the middle of now is a collaboration between research universities, industries who understood the value of investing in the technologies right. for their future, and a federal government who realized its role in that, not just as a funder, but also as a research. So the National Laboratory Systems, the FFRDCs, that triad, which was unique until recently in the world, has been directly responsible for the economy we have today mm -hmm. and the world we live in, for good or bad, with what you think about the world we live in. And I think it's extraordinarily important for us to preserve that as a national asset and to also recognize that in this day and age, other countries have looked at us and they see how important that has been. And so we should not be surprised when they try and copy us. So I, I tell you, I could not ask for a better commentary about past being prologue, right. right? I mean, this whole idea of how we think about roles and responsibilities and capacity in right. this space, particularly in security and resilience, right. is, is really both has been advantaged by that, right. but also to some extent with the growth of industry in this space, right. we think that they've got all of the the shiny, great next things. Right. So that's, uh, I really appreciate it. So Good. trains, connections, advocacy, and doing smart things doing in smart. the future right. that we've done in the, uh, and the way that we've done in the past. Um, I like it. That's a, okay. a really great way to Good. connect. So, so let's take a moment, if we can, and talk about this idea of science foundations behind things, mm -hmm. right? That's one of the things that in cyber in particular, we have a history of, some science in good places, but then some we didn't know what to do, so we did the most logical right. thing we thought that may in fact not in, represent the best options. Right. So, so what do you think about what has been the best innovation in this space that you, know, you sort of feel is science-based? I, I think there's sort of a couple things I would bring to mind. N number one, um, and, and let me sort of confound it with discussions about software in general and Absolutely. sort of a little maybe maybe the external person plugging SCI. The, the the all of the work that's been done in the community to make the process and the evaluation of software writ large uh, to be a mathematical science, mm -hmm. to convert that into a formal process and procedure. So the work that's been done on design systems, the work that's been done on model-based methods, all of those are an attempt to turn chaos into a, into a defined process yeah, because historically we have believed in our ability to add rigor to defined processes. I choose those words very carefully because at some point we start to talk about what's different now. And I think at some point we have entered into a world where not only rigor matters but probability matters too. And so, yeah, and so we have emerged to a place where what got us to the dance may not be sufficient and a much more probabilistic evaluation of threats and responses to threats, it, it, that's going to be necessary in the future. But to your original question, I think this whole um, sort of development of software as an engineering discipline as opposed to an art is directly translatable into the cyber landscape that we have now. Yeah, I think that's right. right. So so my background is um, mathematics and computer science. Right. So I see the world in a way that is definable by a language that is math right. and is programmable and changeable right. by a thing that is computing and, and, and computer science. And so this idea of metrics and measurement as um, the holy grail of cyber that we've right. never actually been able to accomplish, right. um, I think uh, comes because we've been so short-sighted about it. Your, right. your concept of probabilism right. is, I think, really impactful here. What can we observe and how can we make right. good decisions about that? Um, I think that's really, really very helpful. So, so comment for me a bit then on what, well, one, you're a physicist, where's my jetpack? <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to tell you, right? Where's, it's like, where's my okay. jetpack? That's an engineering problem. That's not a <laughs> physics problem. <laughs> well, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, but, but um, you know, what what would you have thought we'd have solved by now? You know, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, th there are things that I am shocked at how far we have progressed versus anything I would have thought. Um, 
I think, uh, so as you know, on the Defense Innovation Board, we have been um, we, we have been snarky and complaining about the poverty of the DOD in terms of capacity to compute and capacity of storage. But in general, the availability of computation, bandwidth, and storage is light years beyond what I would have predicted 15 years ago, where we are now. Um, I think the democratization of software mm -hmm. as something people do is much further along than I ever thought. We can talk in a little bit about what some of the implications yeah. of that are. So, so I think those are those are a couple of the biggest things. Um, uh, what hasn't happened, sort of the, the opposite question. I, I was. Oh, let me just say one other thing. Um, so, I grew up in healthcare in diagnostic imaging. I would never have predicted the progress we have made in display quality mm -hmm. and the ability to diagnose from soft media. I mean, it just if. I mean, first of all, the hoops we all jumped through 20 years ago to even move data around and present it to a radiologist yeah. and a radiologist who was, God forbid, never going to do a diagnosis on a screen and was never going to take cues from a queuing system. Right. I am actually quite surprised at how rapidly that situation changed. Um, and I would argue, another theme we can come back to, this whole issue on the implications of dual use in driving technology Absolutely. and the security implications from it. So. Um, so what has not changed, or what has not progressed as fast yeah. as I thought? Um, I would have thought we would have solved the assured identity and uh, individual ownership of cybersecurity as a as a discipline long before now. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have made progress, but I think there's a there's much more progress that needs to be made. Um, uh, I would have expected that. 20 years ago, I, I would have said we would have run out of Moore's Law capability a long time ago on silicon standard CMOS compute and memory, and that would have forced us mm -hmm. to have much faster alternate kinds of computation. And I don't mean to downplay mm. accelerators of one kind or another, but I would have expected us to be in a different place by now. That's interesting. Yeah. That, uh, uh, what I Maybe I'm, I'm not capturing this right, but what I hear is... Uh, some things forced us to make innovations in unusual places, right? right? Moore's Law, and, right. and you know, we, we innovated That's in some, right. some really unusual places. Mm -hmm. The other one, I, I, if I can uh, pivot from your identity and uh, and an yes. individual security question a bit, of, um, to me that strikes me to be a a real example of uh, the nexus between technical solutions and innovations and adoption and policy. Um, activities as well, right? right. Because there's a, uh, and, and I think right. that ties us into this dual use That's issue. Right. Right. Really interestingly, we no, we right. seem to fight this all the time. We we know what the right technical answer is. Is it really the best answer for the situation? Right. So so talk to me a little bit about. Let's explore this idea of, of uh, dual use here in in the way mm. you characterized it. Yeah, I think I think so. I come to this discussion uh, both from a national security discussion and from a from a what the department, for example, mm -hmm. should be doing. And as you know, we did this sort of big software study around yep. software acquisition. And so historically, uh, our national security position layered on top of brilliant people who do amazing things with dedication and you don't win wars by having an army that doesn't have soldiers who go out in the field right. and do so. So take that all as a given and the fact that I'm not going to focus on that doesn't doubt right. that, right? But we have also, uh, and people use this term, um, uh, offsets. We, we have had major strategic overmatch capability. Um, we could outspend, right. out-technology people on nuclear weapons. Under Bill Perry's leadership and a bunch of really smart people, we outspent and out-engineered and out-invented people around stealth. And the right. dual use changes the landscape because many of the technologies that are important for competitiveness in a modern environment d directly depend on what the commercial sector also wants. So while it is very clear that the national security mission has exquisite imaging applications, it is also clear that many of the imaging technologies that are used for the commercial sector have direct application. Um, the same thing on communications, the same thing on autonomy and robotics, all those mm -hmm. sorts of things. The implications of that are twofold. One, the places you will look for progress in the technology are different than 
I have people who do only that mission, right? right? And so the places you will look for expertise. Um, the other implication is that you have to be very careful about thinking through uh, restrictions you place on technologies. So while it is very obvious that we don't want a lot of people running around with nuclear detonators, it's also easy to say there really isn't a commercial market for nuclear <laughs> weapons, so you're not going to hurt anybody by restricting nuclear detonators. <laughs> That's a different story when you start to talk about restrictions on technology that are driving our economy. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so, you know, and ultimately that has implications for the, fa well, implications. People need to remember that all the things we talk about from a cybersecurity um, landscape re mm -hmm. relative to national security are just as important for the cybersecurity of our commercial sector. Right. And, and, you know, the, the damage to restrictions on the commercial sector it's not a binary problem anymore. So. Yeah, I think and so. The way you characterize dual use, we, um, my experience uh, over the last several decades is our thinking about what the, those two words mean together has evolved. That's right. Right, dual use used to mean <clears throat> offense defense, right, exclusively, right, and now it's, it's commercial we, and right. national security. Right, we, we bit the apple for yeah. cots, and we are all in, yeah. and uh, right. and we've evolved to a place where not just critical infrastructure, but Oh, Just lots everything. of infrastructure. Right, right. exactly. Right. So. And, and also changes how you need to think about your investing. I mean, in an area of, you know, sensors for low Earth orbit satellites, mm -hmm. there are presumably some exquisitely necessary sensors, but by and large, the department or the government probably shouldn't be trying to out-invest the private sector because the private sector has a driving need to, to have a business model that works. And so... Right. There's a, there's a win in there for us, too. We just need to be careful how we capitalize. The, the last point I would make is that, is that the other implication of that is that technology is available to everybody. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, I think, in a lot of ways need to recognize, in addition to places where we need to be unique, there are places where we just need to be faster than the other guy. Right. Because they have just as much access, not even talking about illegal access to technologies, but they have just as much access to commercial technology as we do, we just better be quicker than anybody else at getting it into the place where we need it. So um, speed is a really interesting dynamic, yeah. right? I know you've done a lot of work in speed in acquisition and right. speed in software. And and for me, I really struggle with understanding, with, with thinking about a future where the boundary between software and something other than software might exist. Right. So, uh, so for me, this idea of how do we do things more agilely um, and faster? And how does that change how you think about the security right. and resilience concepts? Yeah, so, so the first thing I would say is, um, and you're in some sense referencing also the software study we mm -hmm. did, there's a very, very important first message in there, which is, they always tell you when you, when you try to make a point, you don't undercut yourself ahead of time. Right. But the first point we made in that study was not all software is the same. Exactly. Right? And so my version of that when I was at United Technologies was uh, you can make your own choice, but I'm not going to ride on an airplane for which the engine control software, which is the real-time mm -hmm. software to manage it, has been crowdsourced. You can decide if you want to do that. I'm not going to. That's a fundamentally different level of rigor than the software that we had people developing for an app on your phone to call the elevator, right? right? And so we do need to be sort of very mature about not saying everything is the same and everything has the same restrictions associated with it. The place where speed becomes really important is when we loop it into the validation and assurance of software. And we need to be careful about which kinds of software for which we do all the normal things that we can do to ensure the software is as good as it can be, but we strongly benefit from a mentality that says, let me get it out there and see what happens and get rapid feedback on it. Of course, you have to understand the consequences of that before you do that. Um, and if the consequences are low and you're willing to take the risk of it getting wrong and you know how to roll back and you know how to process, then a theory that says speed matters more than 100% accuracy is a good theory because I can continue to iterate mm -hmm. on the loop. You know, that's different than saying, if I get this wrong, the banking system comes down. And right. so, so I think that's the important part of the conversation that, that we always have to have, which is to, to scale ourselves to the, to the risk. So we have any number of examples where someone thought their thing was less right. pivotal, where they, they bought in on this idea that not all software is the same, right. but then they connected pieces that weren't all the same right. into an environment where they 
were treated the same. Right. I think zero trust is an idea that's trying to help uh, right. a, a tackle that. How do you how do you think about that? And mm-hmm. how do you think about the things that you need to do to live in a zero trust environment while you're also agile? Right. So so I would say two step two themes that come together. First is that um, I would argue that when we talk about important disciplines for the future. And we have these cards, how many, how many machine learning people are we gonna need right. to make the country operate, et cetera. Um, the skills to understand consequences, what in the sort of physical world we used to call failure modes and effects analysis. Yeah, exactly. That skill is an underappreciated skill in software systems. Um, combine that with much stronger ability to do in the loop simulation of our software systems Mm -hmm. to be able to predict where systems could go. Um, Of course, we never get it all, but again, we go back to this sort of probabilistic view of things, but those are underappreciated skills in my mind. So so that's one thing I would say. Um, What was the second question? Oh, zero trust. Zero trust, oh yeah, okay, so. (laughs) You've been thinking a lot about this, I know. Yeah, yeah, so. So um, I think the concept of zero trust uh, is something that we have put in one box and we need to open the box up. So we have talked about zero trust in some sense purely as a networking issue. So how do I operate in a world where, uh, where I can't assure the, the integrity, cybersecurity mm-hmm. of the network, of the transmit? And, and the answer to that is, you know, sort of encryption at rest, encryption in flight, et cetera, and maybe it becomes encryption in compute. Um, I think the concept of zero trust needs to be expanded much higher. It's what if I operate in a world where I can't trust anything? I can't trust my supply chain. Right. I can't trust that the encrypted data is really the data that I thought it was. And I think I think there's a lot of work we have to do in the way we engineer systems to determine what level of trust we actually can have and what tools we have. So, you know, there's a whole body of work going on, so both here, uh, here at SEI, but also up on the main campus and around the world on what does it mean to compute on encrypted data? Right. And what does, what capability does that allow me to still have when I simply don't trust the network? Uh, my other example is, uh, and I'll be a little bit provocative here for a moment, um, you know, what is the likely path forward for 5G? Mm-hmm. Right. We as a country can decide and likely we'll see. We as a country can decide that certain providers are simply not trustworthy. I think we no longer have the capacity to make those decisions for the world. And so we will be in a situation where untrusty hardware and software are out in the market. And we need to understand the limits of what we still will be able to do in a circumstance. You know, lo- long ago, when people first started computing, the answer was, or the, the statement was, how do I make a reliable computer out of a million unreliable parts? I think there's a lot of, go back to our p- very beginning, there's a lot of math and there's a lot of formalism that has mm-hmm. to be done on how can I do assured computing in an unassured environment. Right. And what we've never <clears throat> solved the problem of reducing the overhead of formalism, right? For sure. And, and mm-hmm. so how, it's interesting that these are recursive issues that we're, we keep, uh, right. we the, keep the, circling the, back around. Yeah, and I would, I would argue that we have solved the issue of, um, of overhead but we don't have a solution because we've just required the system to do more, right? right? So, yeah. so all of this, all of the overhead that would have been prohibitive ten years ago, That's we can compute fast enough to take care of that. Computing's cheap now, right? Exactly. Computing storage is cheap. Exactly. But we never sort of swallow the benefit because we just move on to the, yeah, but I need to do more right. and I need to do more. Yeah, so, exactly. Right. It's a, um, there's a number of really interesting thematics yeah. that we've talked about. This whole idea of how do we create an environment that is like the research enterprise that was built post-World War II right. that will enable us to have a technological foundation that right. is impactful and is world-changing right. um, there is, I think, is, is really key amongst this, this idea of probabilism and measurement yeah. being so important. I think I think the other thing I would add, and it just sort of in the yeah. overall conversation, and, and so I'll try to make some physics analogy here between what, what happens when the scale becomes statistical, right? right? So, and and I would argue that that's, that's a major difference in the cyber environment today than 25 years ago, right? So, so you know this, you've been through this a long time. 
first of all, we started with an assumption that everybody who was on the net, whatever right. it was, was a good guy. Right. And, and Morris taught us that that was not the case. Whether whether they're not a good guy because they're malicious or whether they're not a good guy because they're right. not particularly smart or whatever, we got into situations where we needed to deal with that. Right. I think there's some pretty big changes that are happening now. Um, one brought about by the sort of democratization of software, mm-hmm. just the sheer volume mm-hmm. of how much stuff we need to look at and be assured is okay. And if you project forward with what the Defense Innovation Board is trying to argue for, that's only going to get to a bigger problem because you know the more stuff that can be automated, the more stuff that's software, and as my friend Milo always says, you know, an F-35 is really just a physical way to deliver software effects, mm-hmm. right? So, I mean, that's the world we live in these days. So I think that's one. Um, the second thing I would say is that um, I think we have reached a place where we have, um, in some sense, separated the person who desires an effect from the person who creates the effect. So people use different words, uh, sort of sort of attack as a, surf, as a service. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can go on the dark web, web now and buy cybersecurity infiltration, right? So you have a set of people who who are not spending any of their time figuring out who and why to attack That's something. Right. They're just spending all their time doing it. And so you have a completely disconnected set of people. And I'm not sure that the same rules apply as to how you go about sort of solving that problem in, in, in the world compared to the way we used to. So so scale matters. Right. So Yeah, so that's interesting, and I wish we had a ton more time um, on this one because I I, uh, I didn't intentionally ask you here to agree with you, yeah. um, uh, but I found that uh, many of the things you've brought up are things we've, we've thought about for uh, quite a while. I think about um, a world where we're moving into robotics and where CMU has been so impactful in the artificial intelligence space, right. uh, not just the machine learning and neural network space, but right. artificial intelligence more broadly. Um, it strikes me that I, th- I think about adversaries as attacking a very small number of things, right? And one of the things that they target is our lack of understanding about how the pieces come together mm-hmm. and how the system will react. Mm-hmm. Um, so our sort of lack of ability to think about test cases right. and fault modes right. Um, right. In, in impactful ways. And when we add the kind of speed and non-determinism that comes out of this right. robotic and AI-fueled world where branching into, um, it really changes the way you have to think about security and right, resilience. Right. Um, and so I don't know if you've given any of that thought. Yeah, I, a little bit, and I would, I would just sort of maybe just to continue to riff on it. I think the other, you know, let's sort of be blunt, the world we live in today, it, it is often the case that that creating an effect is less damaging than creating uncertainty. Right, right? that's exactly and, and, right. You know, look, at the end of the day, we can decide we can decide what level of protection we're going to make on our elect- electoral systems, but people are going to go to election this year mm-hmm. with a degree of uncertainty that what they actually do in that box or in the, on right. that ballot is what gets registered somewhere. So just simply creating that level of lack of assurance, um, I think that's a, that's a new plan of attack. And you don't even actually have to deliver the attack. You just have to deliver uncertainty as to whether the attack is going to occur. Yeah. And I think that's a that's a very different place than we were before. So. I th- um, for me, that's a place where the security industry and maybe to some extent the uh, computer science industry has been uh, insular and short-sighted. Right. The, there, there are lots of lessons that you can learn from other domains right. that come in here that we don't need to learn ourselves. Right. Um, I, I have a former boss who called it the Christopher Columbus rule, always separate what's new from what's new to you. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, and, right. and we need to make sure that we're continuing to expand into this right. new space right. because there are so many pieces of it. Yeah. And I think I think it's, um, you know, we've talked a lot about change over time. Uh-huh. I, I think for a place like SEI, um, I think that's a relevant discussion because 30 years ago when CERT mission was stood up, mm-hmm. you know, the people who cared about CERT were the people in the in Washington who said, I need a CERT mission because right. I need to protect national assets, right? Fast forward 30 years, there are a lot of people for whom this is relevant. It goes back to what we said before, mm-hmm. and, and uh, expertise is not all just in one place. There's, right. There are portions of it which are highly specific to mission. But it's also a much broader collection of people who work the problem. And as a society, we need to 
to, to be sure that we're leveraging all of that together. Yeah, I so. think that uh, that's a really great uh, place because it's it's in part about roles. Right. Um, it's in part about collaboration. So back to the things that you started with. Right. Keep the trains running on time. Somebody's got to yeah. understand make it happen, right? how all this gets orchestrated together. Make connections you didn't know were made before. Right. Advocate for all of the pieces right. and really think about that research enterprise right. that's necessary for what the next that's right. 30 years will yeah, be. Yeah, and I think just sort of one code on the whole thing is is um, part of the growth of the tech sector has created folks that don't sit around waiting for someone else to solve the problem. Right. A little bit of this is trust and confidence, a little bit is scope and scale, but you know, 25 years ago or 30 years ago, if somebody said there's a cyber problem, people would have simply looked to the government to solve that problem, right? Nowadays, if you're if you're a large cloud provider, you're not sitting around waiting for someone to solve the problem. Yeah. You own it because it's your business model, right? Yeah. And so, well, I think um, to some extent, the question about what the government's role here ties to a whole bunch of other areas oh, sure. of safety and security. Yeah, right. So I think exactly. it's pretty exciting. Exactly. Yep. It's an interesting time because as a nation, we're really trying to project our own uh, missions yep. through and using this man-made domain right. um, and we've tied our economy to it in other sectors right. and so it's it's really i think an exciting time it that is, we need it's, to it's leverage an incredibly exciting time yeah so, yeah and what do you like best about cmu um i like the fact that if, if you do what i do which is like proselytize for research <laughs> <laughs> it's a uh, it's an incredible set of tools in the toolbox. I mean, I can find the most brilliant people to talk to anybody about stuff that really, really matters. And so that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, I have always tried in my entire professional career to never be satisfied or comfortable. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I love the most about CMU is every day <laughs> I find something that I didn't even think about before. And it could be... A crazy idea, it could be a brilliant idea, sometimes it's both of those at, at the, the same, same time. time, but just the ability for me to randomly run into people and say, tell me what you're working on and get blown away by it. That's the best part of CMU. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank you so much for oh, coming and talking Thank to you. me today. I really appreciate, I appreciate it. it. It's been really good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at Info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.